Hello everybody and welcome to Starting Small Music. I'm Justin McCormick and you're about to hear a conversation with an artist, musician, and music industry professional on their journey and how they got to where they are today. At Starting Small, we like to take you on a journey uncovering the untold stories of your favorite songs and artists. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Just keep a smile on your face and it'll be okay. Try not to be bitter, you gotta do it either way. Keep a smile on your face and it'll be okay. So when life throws a jab, you gotta duck out of the way. Hey, good day, Devin. Good, Justin. How are you, bro? I'm doing good. So getting right through. into your story, you grew up in Detroit. What was your childhood like? Yeah, man. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my dad um, is a drummer. He doesn't still play, but my dad was a drummer and used to play all the time. And so I, I grew up just like as soon as my uh, family brought me home from the hospital when I was born, like I was surrounded by music and drums. Um, so yeah, man, I just, I spent a lot of my childhood just playing drums and literally like People always ask me like, oh, do you, do you remember this show? Or, or did you ever play with these toys? I'm like, no, I just played drums. <laughs> Literally right. just all the time. But yeah, I, I had a great childhood, man. My uh, my mom and my dad have always been supportive and they've been amazing. And growing up in Michigan was was badass. I love it. Now, was your dad playing like in, in any bands when you were growing up or was he just mostly playing at home? So my dad played in a couple original bands, but they never like did any tours or anything like that. You know what I mean? And my my dad never took it to that level because he ended up having us, me and my brother and, you know, living the family life. But then he would play in, you know, cover bands and he always did it for fun just because, you know, he loved it and made him feel good. Like my dad's been playing his whole life. Yeah. So he would, you know, he, he would bring me on stage with him when I was like six to like play Jimi Hendrix or Van Halen or like whatever. And yeah, so my dad doing that is a big, is a big influence on, you know, like me, like getting it an earlier start and like having the experience of like, you know, playing at bars and being around that scene. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's so, it's funny that yeah. you say that too, cause that was going to be my follow-up question. Cause that's what got me into music was my grandpa played steel guitar in a country band. And I remember getting snuck into the Legion post at like six years old too, getting pulled up on stage. It's, it's funny getting your start on the bar circuit that early. <laughs> yes. Yes, man. My, my dad had me playing bar gigs with him. Yeah. At six. And you know, even like before I joined my first band when I was 14, up until that point, I, my dad would always, I would always go to my dad's gigs. I would always get fired up about like, I, We'd go set up like way early in the day because it's nothing like Broadway. Like you play a you play a cover set in Michigan at a bar. You're bringing your PA. You're bringing your kit. You're bringing heads. You're bringing everything. Oh yeah. Um, and I used to get so fired up, man. I would set my dad's kit up for him all perfect, and um, they would. My dad would go up and sing, and I would play drums, and we would do like "Ain't Talking About Love," uh, you like you really got me, Voodoo Child, Good Times, Bad Times. Um, yeah, dude. So that, that was a, that was a very fun period for sure. Now, what are some of the first bands you remember hearing around the house at an early age that made you feel kind of a connection to music? Oh, dude. Um, Avenged Sevenfold was my first, cause mind you, I'm a metalhead at heart, right? I play, I play country music now, crazy enough, but I am a metalhead at heart. Um, but Avenged Sevenfold was my first love. I was like, I was like three years old wearing a girl's extra small death bat shirt because my dad couldn't find any like a kid size or anything like that. And uh, that was the first band that really, really locked me and being like, oh, my God, like this is insane. Um, but besides that, my, my dad's original band, it was called Killing Machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that growing up, like as just a little, little, little kid, I would listen to those songs and watch my dad's band rehearse and, you know, everything like that. So between my dad's music and Avenged Sevenfold, that made me just very, very, very curious. And then my dad introduced me to Led Zeppelin and he introduced me to The Doors and he introduced me to Dio and Ozzy. And then, you know, it, and then I found Slipknot and I was like, oh my God. So yeah, man, it's just been a, it's yeah. 
metal <laughs> metal now, music was it cool for you growing up in detroit like knowing like like the history that detroit has with like that kind of music too yeah man absolutely um my dad would even tell me all the time too just about like like harpos and you know the fillmore and just like legendary spots um that that he would play back in the day and then for me like you know like there's the shelter underneath st andrews hall in detroit and that's where eminem you know an eight mile that's where the whole the last everybody from the 313 put your motherfucking hands up and follow me like that like all that shit happened at the shelter right so yeah. for me playing at those venues growing up was always so sick and like like first time i played st andrews hall that was like <clears throat> like i felt like i was playing my first like arena show you yeah. know what i mean like it was absolutely just like so sick for me and, but yeah detroit has a lot of really awesome history and the music scene uh the music scene there is also pretty badass and you know over the years it's changed like every other music scene but it's it's always been strong you know for sure what's your earliest memory uh first sitting down on a drum set <laughs> uh my so my dad my dad got me my first drum set when I was two and a half and it was wow. a little red TKO kit. And I sat because before, you know, my dad would, you know, he'd let me sit behind his drums, but I remember I couldn't even reach the pedals. I could, he had his rack tom so high. I could barely, I was just hitting the rims. Um, but he, oh, he had this old Ludwig maple, just old beat up Tom Tom from like the seventies. Yeah. And starting off, my dad, you know, because I would naturally, as a baby, whatever, I'd take two spoons, whatever, I'd be playing. My parents never really noticed. Um, <clears throat> and then my dad noticed, because, you know, obviously, if I had a kid with what I do, I'd be like, oh, my God, he's got a, a spoon in one hand and a fork in the other hand. Play a beat. <laughs> um, but my dad was like, all right. So he'd put the tom in front of me. And I'd always be playing it. Um, but then he got me my first kit. And I remember specifically, like, um, my, my drum set being in the basement, <clears throat> I love my whole life. I've always loved changing my setup. I've always been inspired by other drummers and like their setups. And it brings out a different style audio when you change, you know, your comfort zone, you know, yeah, totally. I, um, but I would always ask my dad to be like, Hey, can you raise my cymbals? <laughs> like I wouldn't, I couldn't just loosen it, raise it, tighten it. I'd be like, Hey dad, dad can you, can you raise these symbols for me? Like all the way up here. And then I'd be like, all right, can you bring them back down? Um, but yeah, at, from like two, like two and a half, I just, I remember just, I have like slight visions of just like my dad showing me little things and me asking him to move stuff and, you know, me just getting so excited and running downstairs, getting behind the kit and just playing for, for an hour straight, you know? And, um, yeah, yeah. So is it in high school then that you uh you formed your first band you said then? So I was I was homeschooled during middle school and high school. Gotcha. Um I went to public school during elementary school, like kindergarten all that shit. Um but I never really I never started my own band. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I've 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 never been like all right, me and my best friends that I've known for a while or went to school with, we're going to we're going to get some line sixes and some deans and I'm going to get this kit and I'm going to fucking be a rock star. Like that was never, I always just played in my basement. Like yeah. my dad's, you know, bandmates and I could never find anybody for a long time to play with because nobody liked or could play Avenged Sevenfold or Slipknot or, you know, the stuff that really interests me. Um, and then when I was right, like right before I turned 15, um, you know, cause I would, you know, I'd look people up on Facebook. If I saw they had an amp in their profile picture, I'd message them and be like, Hey, do you want to jam? I'm looking for a guitarist or I'm looking for a da da da. Um, and this, this band of dudes, um, who the bassist of my first band, um, his name's Brett rounds. He's still my best friend till this day. And he's seen me grow a lot and I've seen him grow a lot. And he's, he, he's literally one of my oldest friends. Yeah. Um, but this band was called the four of us are dying. <laughs> and it was some like Nintendo core, like before a breakdown, there's like a doo ding, like, you know what I'm saying? Like a Mario shit. Yeah. Um, and it made me a better drummer, but it was just like, everybody was a bunch of clowns. Like, 
we didn't know what we were doing, but that was the introduction of me being able to like start getting my name out there for people to be like, yo, who's this kid? And mind you, my dad gave me his kit. And it is a, if you can imagine this, like a Vinnie Paul from Pantera style kit, mm -hmm. uh, Tama, oversized shells, two kicks, you know, all that stuff. But Bengal tiger stripe cloth wrapping on the That's show. Dope. So it looks like it came out of like a strip club or something. <laughs> you got a chubby 15 year old coming into a club playing a show. And everyone else in my band is like six, seven years older than me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people were like, what the hell? But that played a huge part in me just like climbing the ladder. You know what I mean? So For sure. I, uh, I, I hit up a random person and he was like, we got a drummer. You know, I'm in a band. Sorry. He hit me up a few months later and was like, hey, are you in a band? <clears throat> and, my, and he came over, the vocalist of that first band came over to my dad's place in Detroit in the fucking hood because um, we grew up. We, we grew up in Detroit mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I played, I just went off in front of the dude and he was like, he was like, holy shit. <laughs> and my dad's standing there, my dad's standing there and he's like, <clears throat> you got the fucking gig or what? <laughs> and the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got the gig. He's got the gig. Um, but yeah, so that was, that, that was definitely an exciting time. So what age did you start really trying to push your social media to? And like, were you just posting covers just for yourself or were you posting them trying to grow a social media and like maybe pick up a touring gig? Um, I, you know, from like 16 on, I'd always just posted drum videos cause I liked it. Not necessarily cause I had it in my mind that I was going to be a big YouTuber or I was going to be a big, you know, big person on social media or any or any type of influencer at any standpoint at all um it naturally kind of happened during uh covid honestly when when covid hit quarantine happened you know i was that was at the point to where you know i had been posting drum videos i had done some drum covers but nothing to the consistency or to the extreme of you know, making it a weekly thing, making it a lifestyle, not just something that's fun, you know what I mean? Which it is fun, but you know, it becomes a lifestyle. Um, quarantine, I was in hollow front at that time. Like that was the time where, you know, I'd, I was in hollow front for a couple of years so far and we were doing the DIY tours playing, you know, hundred cap, 200 cap rooms, you know, the sold, sold out shows, but it's kids just going fucking ballistic. You know what I mean? So like, that was my means of getting content and going out on the road and doing all that shit. I had just graduated high school. You know what I mean? Well, a couple of years before 2018, I graduated high school, but uh, you know what I mean? No, I was, I was like 20, you know, yeah. when COVID. So, um, you know, when that happened, I was just like, okay, you know, I can't tour. It's what I love to do the most. I can't, you know, there's, there's no other means of me being able to, you know, establish my brand awareness. Um, so I was like, I kind of want to start posting more and more drum videos. And there was this producer named Paul Raymond out of Lapeer, Michigan, that had been watching my stuff for a minute. He was a fan of Hollow Front's music. He hit me up and he was like, hey man, like I, I really like your style would love to do some drum videos with you. I'd love to have you come in. We'll do a couple for free, see if you like it. Um, and, you know, did that, went great. I was amazed because he had his own studio, great videographer, you know, shit like that. I could, he could get the job done yeah. um, and better than most, you know, realistically. And uh, after that, we were like, all right, well, let's make a deal that you'll pay this much a month and you can come in once a week, two times a week, whatever. And we'll just batch content and we'll just grind, 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 grind. And it wasn't a matter of, you know, I'm going to get all these followers and I'm going to do this, even though that was a big goal. It was like, all right, I want to hit 10,000 followers. Okay. I want to get SJC's attention. Okay. I do want to get these companies attention. I want to, I want to go about this a certain way to where it's like, I'm I'm branding myself like I have these companies representing me, but when in reality, they don't know who the fuck I am, but I can use them to my advantage. Right. And I just do just video after video after video after video, not giving a fuck about what the next guy's doing, not giving a fuck about what this band's got going on, not giving a fuck how good this drummer is, 
support everybody, keep your head down low, keep the blinders on and fucking grind. That's the only way to do it, right? And if you have the attitude of, oh, why did this guy get this gig and I didn't get this gig? Well, then maybe you should reevaluate your fucking attitude because you're not getting the opportunities for a reason, obviously. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, video after video after video after video after video, blah, 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 bro, like, it, and it's still like, even though touring is a priority and how much I'm out with Austin and, you know, I do the session work for David Morris and, you know, all the studios around Nashville and whatnot. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's still a priority for me to do drum content. Like, you, you know, even though it, things have changed and it's just like my, like things have evolved, but drum content will always be a part of my, you know, monthly routine. I'll go into the studio once a month and get, you know, nine to 12 videos done that'll last me the month. You know what I'm saying? To be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, yeah, COVID, quarantine, I hit that shit hard, haven't stopped. Um, and that's what honestly changed my music career was making that decision and putting the practice, patience and persistence into that. And that landed me a lot of cool shit that I've always dreamed of my whole life. You know what I mean? So that's why I always encourage people to hop on that shit because it, you know, it's such a useful tool that's at our fingertips and, you know, all you need is just a homie to let you know how to use those tools and you can run with it and do it as your own. For you know sure. I mean? Yeah. Now, what was the decision like to make the move to Nashville then uh, coming out of that band? Yeah. Um, I, dude, I'll tell you what. And I, I love telling this story because like this shit impacted me hard. So my last tour with Hollow Front, um, Beer Never Broke My Heart, Luke Combs, everyone knows the song. I had no fucking clue what that song was. I didn't know who Luke Combs was. I would never listen to country. I grew up on Johnny Cash, you know, shit like that. But I was never a country fan. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, ask me one Miranda Lambert song, couldn't fucking tell you. Um, <laughs> but uh, a band called Silent Planet, Chris Gazel, uh, their front of house, would do a virtual sound check to test all the PA, whatever, uh, with Beer Never Broke My Heart. First, and it's a, mind you, it's like a month long run, maybe like a little more than a month. Um, so, mind you, day one, first show. And I'm like, I'm like, who is this? And then I hear Luke come in. I'm like, this is country. <laughs> I was like, why does this go hard? I was like, can someone tell me why this goes hard? And, uh, you know, week goes by, two weeks go by. You know, each, each day I'm setting up my kit, each show. You know, I'm hearing that and I'm like head bobbing more and more. I'll let the, I'll let take the hat off, start head banging and shit and like get all into it. And I start having like these visions, like these just daydreaming at night. Like we'd be on the road, we'd be driving, we'd be, you know, traveling, whatever. And I'd, I'd have these visions. Like it just stuck with me. It just like, it's like it flipped a switch that I didn't know was there. And, um, it just got me thinking very hard and, uh, hollow front we we were in a bus accident on that tour about two and a half weeks in um and that was a really hard time for everybody and you know i think just with how stressful it was and everything that came with that it, it just didn't necessarily pan out the way we wanted it to at the end of the day um you know, no, no bad blood with anybody. It's just one of those things where it's just, I was starting to feel like God was pushing me to do something out of my comfort zone with the gift that he gave me. You know okay. what I mean? And, um, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what necessarily that entailed, but all I knew is that I, I, I wanted to do something else than play blast beats and patterns and you know that and, and that was it so um shout out to cody ash drummer of jelly roll he's a he's a really good buddy of mine and i was picking his brain a lot after the bus accident and we got back on the road we finished out the tour we persevered we made it happen and i'm, I'm really proud of you know that camp for that 
Um, but I was, you know, starting to pick Cody's brain and just being like, bro, why am I having these thoughts? And he was like, yo, do it. Like, like fucking do it. Like come move to Nashville, come move in with me and my girl. Like, like what, like whatever we got to do to make it happen, do it. Cause you'll crush it. Yeah. And I would talk to him about it a lot. Um, and I would really, I would really pick his brain and, you know, it, it was, ner- it was really nerve wracking, just a really weird nerve wracking feeling that I wasn't sure about. Um, got home from that tour, uh, had gotten a couple other very big offers to play for metal bands that I turned down and I made the decision that I want to move to Nashville and I want to, I want to play country. And at that decision, at that point, you know, it, it was scary. It was really scary. I, I parted ways with, with hollow front and I drove to grand Rapids from Detroit to, to, you know, for us all to have that conversation. Um, and Cody hit me up about this new artist. Um, he was like, Hey, I want to throw your hat in the name, whatever. Uh, it was for Bailey Zimmerman. Yeah. And I had no idea who that was. Cody was like, this would be a full-time thing. Um, obviously didn't get that gig, had a great conversation with his manager. They needed someone like that. And now another very close friend of mine, Max Miller is absolutely ripping the shit out of that gig. Um, and we just played a show with them like a week ago. Uh, we were direct support for Bailey. Um, in Michigan, funny enough. And it was a great time. That whole camp, so nice, such a great show. Uh, They put on a fantastic show. Uh, But the fact that my name was even put in the hat and that I had our phone call with the manager blew my fucking mind. I don't care if I got the gig or not. The fact that, that that was a sign from God. That was a God wink being like, go, go. And in my, and in my opinion, you know, opportunity comes in stages, right? You're not going to get the same opportunity twice with the same work ethic. I'm not going to get signed by Vic Verth again. If I lost that deal, God forbid, I'm not going to get signed by Vic Verth again with the same work ethic. I have to top myself, right? So that comes with opportunities and, you know, depending on what stage you're at in your life, you know, it's going to get to a certain point to where you're going to have to give a little. You're going to have to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and you're going to have to put that in God's hands in the universe's hands, however the fuck you want to term it. Um, it's going to get to a certain point to where you got to start to give and take a risk, right? With no expectation, you have to be a servant to the craft. And that's exactly the mindset I got in um, was I, I, you know, I, I would have conversations with God and say, you know, I'm putting this in your hands. I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I'm scared. But also at the same time, I know that I'm, I'm capable and I have my faith in you and I have my faith in the universe and I'm a servant to the craft and I'm going to bust my ass. Right. And um, yeah, man. And I, my plan was to move in the spring. I was hit with a random opportunity to move into who are now like two of my closest friends. Um, shout out to Chase Ryan and shout out to Christian Stoles. Uh, one of the best vocalists uh, chases and Christian's one of the best fiddle players on Broadway in Nashville in general, in my opinion. Um, But, you know, they gave me the opportunity. They were like, yo, we know your brother. We, we met up with them in Nashville. My brother was having a binger for his birthday with his friends. Long story short, my brother's best friend from high school was chasing Christian's drill sergeant in the Marines. My brother's friends were having a binger about this time last year. And uh christian and chase stayed with my brother and his friends the whole weekend and you know my 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 brother showed showed them a great time um and my brother facetimed me when they were all drunk and they were like yo you're gonna move in with these guys i'm like talk to me when you're sober well they called me when they were sober and they were like yo we're moving into a new apartment hermitage like come on down our couch is huge we got room for you like you don't have to pay anything get your feet wet and you know do your thing and they've become my closest my my closest friends my my brothers you know what i mean that's dope Um, yeah man so the way everything worked out is just insane and 
now I'm playing the biggest shows of my life, and it's fucking nuts. Now you mentioned that uh, you play for Austin Snell. How do you? When did you guys first meet, and uh, how's it been on the road? I mean, you guys are the shows are only getting bigger, and it's such an electric set. Kind of tell me about playing for Austin. Yeah, dude. So um, shout out to Pablo, John Langston's drummer. Um, also, he used to play for Chelsea Grin, a great metal band that I looked up to thoroughly growing up. Um, you know, he randomly hit me up and was like, yo, uh, are you available this day, whatever? And I was like, yeah, what's up? He's like, I was supposed to play Whiskey Jam with this new artist. His name's Austin Snell, um, but I'm sick. Or it was something like that. And he was like, would you be able to cover the gig? And I was like, yeah, I would love to. And, you know, I was so excited. I've heard about Whiskey Jam so much because it's, a, you know, it's kind of a big deal, you know, for Nashville. And um, uh, I got in touch with Austin and, you know, I heard Excuse the Mess. That was the only song he had out. He had just put it out. It was blowing up. Um, I had heard Excuse the Mess and I was like, What? I was like, this is like gruntry. I love that word, grunge, yeah. like grunge uh, country. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but I was like, why? I was like, why does this go hard? I was like, why does country go hard now? I was like, this has never been this way. And uh, I loved it. I ate it up. I ate it up, dude. And got in touch with Austin. Uh, we got to know each other just briefly over the phone, and we were vibing. Uh, we had a rehearsal at uh, River House, and rehearsal went amazing. Um, you know, we played we played Whiskey Jam. Set the three songs went amazing. He was like, "Hey, brother, I would like for you to stick around." And you know, he was like, "Do your thing, like you know, make your money." But like when you know schedule starts to get you know filled up. You know, I would I would love for you to just you know play for me full time like that would be amazing and you know I was I was on board like just the the chemistry and the vibes it just felt like family right right off rip and that was something you know I I wanted you know coming here and whatever artist I would play for full time I wanted that family dynamic and I wanted to make sure that you know that was established um, and so after that some time passed and schedule started getting busy and um this summer has really been the busiest that we've been um but dude it's just been an insane ride especially like i mean for for austin especially like you gotta think man like he put his first song out not even a year ago right and before that he wasn't on stage he never played a full band gig. He got thrown to the wolves. He got thrown into it hard. Um, and the way that he's handled himself and the way that he has been blessed with a great support system and a great team um, and a great uh, great girlfriend. Is, uh, shout out to his girlfriend, Allie. Uh, Allie Brooke is awesome. She handles all the wardrobe and um, everything like that. She's awesome. Um, you know, it's, he's created, he's created his own family for himself, a strong team. And him and I have gotten very, very close. And, uh, you know, just between just the experiences that we've had, you know, standing side stage for Luke Combs, you know, opening for him at the, you know, the, uh, um, like the whiskey jam event thing. It was at Ford field in Detroit. And, uh, we played that and we got to hang out for the show. We met Luke and his, his whole crew and his whole band and everybody is just insanely nice. Shout out to Kurt also from Ray's Rowdy. Uh, he, he's insane. Um, crazy talented player too. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'd like Austin and I just standing side stage and we'd just like put our arms around each other and be like, like, yeah, it's going to be us one day, man. Like just that's and I would tell him like I hope you're ready for it, bro. <laughs> like, Heck yeah. And literally, just even since then, you know, things have excelled so much to where it's, you know, being being direct support for Jelly Roll, opening for Keith Urban, like Tyler Farr, like him going out with Willie Nelson. It's, you know, we're opening for Nickelback in September. Like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? So it's right. it's just crazy how things have excelled so so quickly. Um, but I'm so proud of them, dude. 
I'm so I'm, I can't I can't say it enough how proud I am of Austin and everything that we got planned, everything that we got coming up. Um, a lot a lot more uh, announcements to be had. Um, a lot a lot of exciting things in the works, and also Austin's first headline tour in the fall, uh, which is going to be a great time. Um, but but all in all, man, yeah, it's uh, ever since that whiskey jam, Austin and I have you know just gotten closer and closer, and he's become like a brother to me. And uh, just a lot of the shit that we're experiencing together is a first for the both of us, even though I, you know, I, I don't have all the tour experience, but I graduated in 2018 and started touring full time that summer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just with all the experience I have and what he's experiencing, like it's just it's all it's still new and fresh and exciting and um, for, for the both of us. And, you know, we, we pray before every set. We, you know, we thank God. And, you know, for, for everything that we have and for every show that we're able to play, whether if it's in front of 10,000 people or 10 people, you know, um, but, you know, it's, it's a strong family dynamic and the, the sky is the limit with that with that kid. So, yeah, we're stoked. We're very excited. Now, I like to close my interviews by asking, what's a piece of advice you've learned along your journey that you'd give to the aspiring musicians out there? It's a really good question. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things I would say. Um, but I don't know. I feel like mo most importantly, um, <laughs> forgot where I heard this from. I can't, I can't steal this cause I heard it from somewhere a long time ago. Um, but I've, it's always stuck with me, man. It has always stuck with me. And that's, you know, like, like I'm not the best. You're not the best. J uh, fucking Tony Royster Jr. Thomas Lang you know, whatever is not the best. Yeah. But as long as you stay true to yourself, as long as you stay humble, you support others, you, you are your true character on and off stage. If, as long as you do those things, then the best cannot fuck with you. You don't need to worry about who's better than you. You don't need to worry about who's doing this and who's doing that because nobody else is you. You are authentic. You are yourself. And as long as you portray that and you stay true to that, then the best can't fuck with you. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment. And check out my music on all streaming platforms at Justin McCormick. See you guys next time.